took on the way of 99.8%, 99.8% of all other species that have ever existed on this planet and gone extinct. Now, I just rubbed that in once more. 99.8% of all the forms of life ever to appear on this terrestrial globe are gone, wiped out. And it was nearly us. And it don't, this doesn't, to me, give the evidence of a design of uh, the finger of a god of any kind, let alone one who wishes us well. It rather suggests to me that nature and the world are a and human life are a struggle. You'll tell me when I've got a uh, word you say, a minute or two. Give me a wave. I, thank you. I, didn't, I felt I was getting close to trespassing on Dr. Dembski's time. Um, now, it's, really very, it's really worth your time to write off to the National Geographic. They'll send you back a kit. You scrub the inside of your cheeks, put it in a, a solution, send it back. They will show you a map of where your ancestors came from in Africa and at what time and what route they took to get to where you are now. It will be very eye-opening. I strongly suggest you do it. While I have your attention, I also suggest on the matter of evolution that you read a book by Dr. Francis Collins called The Language of God, Dr. Collins, as you may know, ran the Human Genome Project, which analyzed our kinship with other animals, and, and we now know the whole extent of our genetic uh, code and ID, including the, the messy gaps in it that are Dr. Dembski's speciality, um, and brought this in ahead of time and under budget, and is the greatest student of DNA and stem cells and all that go with it who we have amongst us. I, I would say the greatest American living physician. I am prejudiced. He's a great friend of mine. He's also been a great help to me in my current illness. Um, he's a great American. He's also a great Christian. That's why I recommend him to you. A very strong and believing Christian. And the chapters in his book, The Language of God, that tell you, don't waste your time not believing in evolution. Don't let anyone tell you it didn't take place. Nice, simple, clear, brilliant chapter is a chapter you are not educated if you have not read. I'll close and say, because I've got only a minute, why wouldn't I believe in this... Uh, why, 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 might, why might one not want to believe in it, even if it could be true? Because my view is that it's not only not true, but it's probably a good thing it isn't. Why is it not a good thing? Because I don't think it's healthy for people to want there to be a permanent, unalterable, irremovable authority over them. I don't like the idea of a father who never goes away. And nor do you, if you think about it, when you get closer to parenthood, you won't say to your children, don't worry, I'll never die. You won't be at my funeral, I'll be at yours. I'll be at your grandchildren's funeral. You'll never hear the end of me. That's actually not loving paternity. Uh, the idea of a king who cannot be deposed, very un-American idea as well as a very un undemocratic one. The idea of a judge who doesn't allow a lawyer or a jury or an appeal. This is an appeal to absolutism. It's, it's the part of ourselves that's not so nice, that wants security, that wants certainty, that wants to be taken care of. For hundreds and hundreds of years, the, the human struggle for freedom was against the worst kind of dictatorship of all, the theocracy, the one that claims it has God on its side, the divine right of kings, the feudal system, the monarchical one against which the American Revolution with its secular humanism uh, took place. I believe the totalitarian temptation has to be resisted, and I believe this is one of its core and origin uh, points. And so what I'm inviting you to do is to consider emancipating yourself from the idea that you selfishly are the sole object of all the wonders of the cosmos and of nature, because that's not a humble idea at all. It's a very arrogant one, and there's no evidence for it. You'd do better to emancipate yourself from it and do some real study of, of genetics and biology and cosmology. And then, again, a second emancipation, to think of yourselves as free citizens who are not in thrall to any supernatural, eternal authority, which you will always find is interpreted for you by other mammals who claim to have access and to this authority that gives them special power over you. Don't allow yourselves, don't allow yourselves to have your lives run like that. I've exhausted my time. I'm really grateful for your attention. I can't wait to be back. Thanks.
Thank you, Mr. Hitchin. Uh, the, the existence of God is really the way to your question. Once that's settled, the goodness of God follows, I would say, straightforwardly. Although I could rehearse standard arguments for God's existence, I want in this debate to take a different tack. Christopher Hitchens disbelieves in God's existence. Why? Lack of evidence and evils perpetrated in the name of religion, he says. In his book, God is Not Great, reveals a more basic reason. Hitchens, as a scientific reductionist, believes science has given us new knowledge and that it destroys religious faith. What is this new knowledge? According to Hitchens, it is Darwinian evolution. You may ask what a chapter on evolution is doing in a book defending atheism. At the end of that chapter, Hitchens explains, quote, we no longer have any need of a God to explain what is no longer mysterious. Let this sink in. Religion, according to Hitchens, renders biological origins mysterious. But now that Darwin has come and shown how natural selection explains biological origins, all is clear. Fellow atheist Richard Dawkins put it more memorably. Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. It's no coincidence that Richard Dawkins, the world's best known atheist, is also an evolutionary biologist. Atheists, like everyone else, need a creation story. Without God in the picture, something like Darwinian evolution has to be true. And so Hitchens, though a humanities guy, lectures his readers on proofs of evolution. Let's look at a few of these proofs as he gives them. One, junk DNA. If Darwin got it right, then our genes are cobbled together over a long evolutionary history, accumulating lots of useless DNA, junk, because it's easier for natural selection to keep copying junk than, rather than editing it out. This sounds plausible, but it is subject to experimental test. In fact, recent findings show that much of this so-called junk DNA regulates gene expression. This is true even of repetitive DNA, the quintessential DNA junk. A forthcoming book titled The Myth of Junk DNA details these findings. Two, the Cambrian explosion. This refers to a narrow slice of the fossil record in which the main animal body plans appear suddenly without any precursors. The Cambrian explosion was a mystery in Darwin's day, and it remains a mystery to this day. Paleontologist Peter Ward writes about the Cambrian explosion as follows, quote, the seemingly sudden appearance of skeletonized life has been one of the most perplexing puzzles of the fossil record. How is it that animals as complex as trilobites and brachiopods could spring forth so suddenly, completely formed without a trace of their ancestors in the underlying strata? If ever there was evidence suggesting divine creation, surely the Precambrian and Cambrian transition, known from numerous locations across the face of the earth, is it. Now Ward, like Hitchens, is an atheist, so he tries to soften this statement later, but the mystery remains. For more on the Cambrian explosion, see my book, The Design of Life. Third point, the inverted retina. Vertebrate eyes have nerve cells in front of the light-sensitive retinal cells. This means that light first has to pass through a barrier before being detected. This seems counterintuitive, but there are good functional reasons for it. A visual system needs three things, speed, resolution, and above all, sensitivity. If the eye isn't sensing light, it's useless. Now, it turns out that the light-sensitive cells are the most oxygen-greedy cells of all cells, and they get their oxygen from blood. The sensitivity here is truly astounding. Some frog eyes can sense the smallest unit of light, a single photon. Positioning the nerves in front of the light-sensitive retinal cells ensures maximal blood supply to the retina and thus maximal sensitivity. But the story gets better. In 2007, it was reported in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that Miller glial cells, these are the little cells, the fat cells that coats the, uh, the nerves, act as optical fibers conveying light to the retina. As the abstract in the article notes, quote, their parallel array in the retina is reminiscent of fiber optic plates used for low distortion image transfer. Thus, Miller cells seem to mediate the image transfer through the vertebrate retina with minimal distortion and low loss. This finding elucidates a fundamental feature of the inverted retina as an optical system and ascribes a new function to the glial cells. So the vertebrate eye is much more sophisticated than Darwinists on their low expectations of design suspected. And thanks to these Miller glial cells, the eye's resolution is magnificent. This is, this is completely unexpected. 
The problems with Hitchens' proofs of evolution don't end here. All his proofs are easily deconstructed. I'm happy to do so during the Q&A, and I have his book with me. Hitchens is obsessed with the human eye, the same eye that has allowed him to read and educate himself as an atheist. Observing different types of eyes in nature, he repeats the chestnut that natural selection gradually has turned a light-sensitive spot into a full-fledged camera eye. No mention that eyes have to be built in embryological development or that eyes are only as good as their associated neural processing. No details from about the genetic changes that would be needed to affect such a transformation. And it's not just that Hitchens doesn't provide that, nobody provides that when they tell these just-so stories about how, how the eye evolved. But to really make his case, Hitchens cites Dan Nilsson and Susan Pelger's mathematical, eye, evol, mathematical model of eye evolution, which he claims shows that eyes could evolve in a geological instant. Let me tell you a secret about mathematical models and computer simulations. Unless you tether them to real observable processes, you can use them to prove anything, in which case they prove nothing. The model of Nilsson and Pelger, which Hitchens praises loudly, is of this sort. I can write a computer program that evolves Richard Nixon into Christopher Hitchens, the scary thought. Such simul simulate prove absolutely nothing. I know what you're all thinking. Since the evidence for evolution is so underwhelming, and since Hitchens has hitched his wagon to evolution, shouldn't he now be ready to abandon evolution and consider the existence of God? Yet this is precisely what he will not do. His atheism demands a materialistic form of evolution, and there's only one going theory of it, namely Darwinism. The alternative, which places us here as the result of design, is for him a non-starter. It's unthinkable. In regarding design as unthinkable, Hitchens puts himself in an atheist straitjacket. For the atheist, we must be here as the result of a blind, purposeless evolutionary process. There are no other options. Atheism demands evolution. Okay, it's not that evolution forces you to be an atheist, but if you are an atheist, that is your only option. For the theist, on the other hand, it's possible that God used an evolutionary process to deposit us here. But it's also possible that God deposited us here in ways that make our design evident. Either of these are live options for the theist, and the theist can consider them fairly. Atheism, however, cannot live without Darwin. Hitchens needs evolution to be true. His treatment of it is therefore calm and deferential, albeit mistaken. 